Welcome to the Tachycardia Bradycardia pre-course webinar review. Um, today presented by myself, Christine Hardy, and Dwayne Cattell, Regional Paramedic Educators. So the objectives today are basically to review both the directives, symptomatic bradycardia and tachydysrhythmia. Um, and then we're going to apply these directives to patient care scenarios. So looking at tachycardia, uh, tachycardia is defined as a heart rate uh, greater than 100 beats per minute. Um, so there's many different causes. Um, and it can range from myocardial ischemia to electrolyte imbalances and also to hypoxia. Um, exercise will obviously increase a person's heart rate. Uh, most people can tolerate uh, an elevated heart rate around between 100 and 120 beats per minute uh, without any adverse effects. So we're just going to very quickly review the tachydysrhythmia medical directive. It's important to note that all of these patients have to be greater than or equal to 18 years old. Um, to perform the Valsalva maneuver or to administer adenosine, um, again the patient must be greater than or equal to 18 years old. Uh, this is in a narrow complex um, rhythm with a heart rate of greater than or equal to 150. When you're moving on to consider your lidocaine and amiodarone, um, this is a, a wide complex rhythm and the rate only has to be 120 or greater. Um, if we have hypotension in any of these cases, uh, that's when we would go straight to our cardioversion directive and in this case we would patch and attempt to get a cardioversion order. Remember as well, um, with your amiodarone and lidocaine, you have to, you have to patch as well. You do have to patch for those medications. So looking at your um, QRS complex, as far as the width goes for your tachycardic rhythms, uh, the ones you're gonna see most of all, um, kind of in order, uh, sinus tachycardia, your atrial fib. However, atrial fib can be wide. You can have aberrancy with a QRS complex greater than 120 milliseconds uh, with uh, atrial fib. Atrial flutter, your AV nodal reentry, and obviously the, the treatable ones, uh, your SVT or, and your PSVTs. For wide with it rhythms that we describe as uh, greater than 0.12 seconds on your ECG or greater than three small boxes, um, our VTAG, SVT with aberrancy, that means SVT with a wide QRS complex, um, and pre-excitation pre syndromes. So in doing our research for this webinar, we found an excellent asthma question, um, and it was regarding using the use of carotid, sin carotid sinus massage. Um, we were all taught this when we went to school as ACPs, and here um, in our region, we will not be performing carotid sinus massage. Again, if you have any other questions um, relating to tachydysrhythmias or any other medical directive, feel free to go to the Ask Mac website and uh, search it. So we have a monthly newsletter that comes out, and in the January of 2011, uh, Dr. Paul Bradford, who is the Regional Medical Director for the Essex-Kent region, um, actually wrote an article regarding the importance and the benefits of vagal maneuvers for specifically for uh, supraventricular tachycardia and proxismal supraventricular tachycardia, um, outlining the the what physio physiological aspects take place um, and what uh, detriment could happen. He also provides in the article um, advice on how to perform the Valsalva maneuver. So take a minute to um, read that over. It's important to note that the Valsalva maneuver is contraindicated in the case of a sinus tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, or atrial flutter. So adenosine is a medication that you'll be considering um, for a patient um, presenting with SVT um, who's greater than 18 years of age. Um, also the rate is narrow. Uh, the rate has to be greater than 150 and it has to be regular. So with adenosine, it's actually it's actually a naturally occurring nucleoside. Um, it's a class one intervention. Uh, it's a rapid, fast acting sodium channel blocker, which slows conduction through the AV node. Uh, the half life is less. It's a few seconds. Some say up to ten seconds. Depends how fast you push and how how much of a flush you get behind it. And just an interesting note, according to the uh, statistics out there. Um, 
with six milligrams given, usually about 60% of the patients that were given six milligrams um, converted to a normal sinus rhythm. Uh, and subsequently, if you had to give an additional 12 milligrams, uh, about, it took a little bit longer, but uh, about 92% of people converted with a 12 milligram dose of adenosine. So take note, this patient is um, normotensive. This means they have a blood pressure of 100 or greater. So what are our contraindications for adenosine? Uh, the first one is uh, obviously an allergy or sensitivity. Um, if the rhythm on your monitor you confirm with a 12 lead is uh, sinus tack, atrial fib, or atrial flutter, it, it just will not have any effect. Um, if you're, the patient is taking carbamazepine, agarnox, or persantine, which is um, agarnox and persantine are dipyderamol, um, then absolutely it's a contraindication. Uh, the adenosine will be potentiated with the uh, agarnox, the dipyderamol, agarnox, persantine, and it will be blocked with the carbamazepine, the tegretol. So the questions we've had regarding this directive is uh, whether or not a 12 lead should be obtained and the answer to this is if you require it and if it doesn't delay treatment. So usually we're working in tandem with a, with a partner and assessing our patient and in the meantime your partner could be obtaining a 12 lead for you to confirm the rhythm. So when discussing amiodarone, um, we're just going to talk about a patient care scenario. So let's say that you went to the community pool for a patient who had a sinkable episode after getting out of the pool. Um, you lay them down on the, your stretcher and the chief complaint is just feeling generally unwell, kind of weak. And what you see on the monitor is a wide complex tachycardia that's greater than 120 beats per minute. You obtain your patient's blood pressure and it's stable. At this point, this is when you would patch for the use of amiodarone or lidocaine according to your tachydysrhythmia um, uh, medical directive. And remember, amiodarone will be given over the duration of administration is over 10 minutes. And then it's 10 minutes uh, interval you have to wait um, before you give another dose of amiodarone. And so that can be accomplished in two ways, either by a slow IV push or it could be administered in a bag in a drip form, just ensuring that the medication is not administered too quickly. So moving on to synchronized cardioversion. So this is where your patient is very, very sick. So they have either uh, a Y complex uh, tachycardic rhythm, 120 beats a minute or greater, or a narrow complex uh, SVT, tachycardic rhythm, or PSVT, 150 beats a minute and greater, and now they are hypotensive. Um, what you do, you need to patch for this. So you would go ahead and call a physician, and the physician will probably stay in the line with you while you're doing the cardioversion. Generally, the shocks are going to be, they'll be at 100, 200, and then your maximum uh, joulage that your machine will deliver, uh, that could either be 200 or 360, but the doc will give you the order on the phone as to what, how he wants the patient shocked, and it has to be synchronized, not unsynchronized. In the event of a patch failure uh, with a sick patient who's hypotensive, you should proceed to synchronize cardioversion. And again, um, those dual settings would be 100, 200, and then your maximum dual setting uh, of your actual defib. So bradycardia. Bradycardia is generally defined as a heart rate of less than 60 beats per minute. Um, however, for treating the patient with drugs or electricity, uh, according to our medical directors, they have to have a heart rate of less than 50 beats per minute, as well as they are all hypotensive. So here's your symptomatic bradycardia medical directive, uh, right out of your uh, medical directive handbook. Um, it addresses atropine, uh, pacing, and dopamine. Uh, in order to proceed with any of these procedures, um, for you have to be 18 years of age and greater, and you, the patient also has to be hypotensive. Uh, for atropine, there is no patch point required, um, and you're allowed to give two doses, each 0.5 milligrams, uh, with a two-minute uh, interval uh, break 
basically. Uh, in order to go on to transcutaneous pacing or to dopamine, a patch is required. Uh, now noted in the American Heart Association HA guidelines, they're really leaning towards uh, dopamine as your next uh, treatment as opposed to, as opposed to uh, transcutaneous pacing. So up on your screen, you see another Ask Mac question. Um, basically, this is to guide your clinical decision making. So what are we doing on this call? Um, the advice here given is that give a dose of atropine while you're preparing for your pacing and while you're patching for your pacing, and this can be repeated times two, and it's appropriate, and it is according to the AHA guidelines. So atropine, um, let's talk about atropine for a minute here. So atropine is classified as a uh, parasympatholytic medication. Um, it has an untoward effect uh, of the parasympathetic nervous system. And how it works, it blocks the uh, muscarinic receptors from receiving acetylcholine and thereby stimulating more acetylcholine to go to the nicotinic receptors and thereby causing decreasing vagal stimulation and increasing the heart rate or kind of like taking your foot off the brake in a car. Yeah. Um, it does similar effects on the heart. That'll increase your heart rate. Now, the contraindications for atropine are an allergy or sensitivity, a history of a transplanted heart, if they're hemodynamically stable, so blood pressure 100 and greater, or hypothermia. So talking about transcutaneous pacing, uh, it is a class one intervention. Um, you need an order for this. Once again, heart rate has to be less than 50. The patient has to be hypotensive. Um, and it could be that they have not responded to atropine after the two doses. So you would get on the line with the base hospital physician and, and order, uh, get an order for transcutaneous pacing. Uh, remember, you have to have electrical and mechanical capture. Um, and you would follow your guidelines for that as far as pulse per minute uh, and setting your milliamps as well as uh, patient may require sedation under the patient sedation directive and interestingly enough this is the only directive that if the, pa the patient's hypotensive so they're actually initially contraindicated for uh, for midazolam for pacing uh, for, for patient sedation as well as morphine or fentanyl for pain. However, once their pressure comes above 100 and then we are allowed to administer that uh, and we do not need to get the order from the physician for that, it is a standing order because the hypotension would generally be caused from the bradycardia. Couple key points is make sure that you have all your monitoring electrodes attached to your patient as well as the pads and if able you should place them front and back and have an IV in place and don't forget your fluid bolus in the hypotensive patient. So in regards to dopamine, uh, dopamine is a naturally occurring catecholamine. Um, it's really dose dependent in the setting of bradycardia for what is going to work uh, to bring their heart rate back up and bring their blood pressure back up. Uh, dopamine will be, you have to call for this in the setting of bradycardia and it's essentially up to the physician of how many mics per kilogram per minute um, that they want to start at. Generally you're probably going to start at 5 mics per kilogram per minute uh, and then you'll increase 5 mics to get the desired effect of blood pressure between 90 and 110. Uh, and at that point you would just hold the dopamine in place. If de service dependent, uh, if you're using a Buretrol, continue as you have been. If the service isn't using Buretrols, then if you have your 60 set, run it with a 60 set. For some reason, if there's no 60 set in the truck, you still can run it through a 10 set. You just have to do the math to figure out your drops per minute. It's probably pretty important to have a dopamine chart either on your person or in your bag at all times because if it's a very stressful call and uh, doing math at this point, you may you may find it difficult. So having a, a chart's a really good. Oh, idea. beneficial, yeah. And the other thing um, is you can run dopamine. It, it's always beneficial to run dopamine through a second, a different line, um, because once you've run dopamine through your main line, if that's all you can get, that's fine. If that's all you can get, but that line is now committed to dopamine.
So let's look at a patient care scenario just as an idea of how this is actually going to work out in the field. You're dispatched for a call to an unconscious patient. On arrival, you find a patient with a GCS of 3, very slow carotid pulse, absent radial pulse. Um, so you need to begin airway and ventilatory support um, and there's been no change in this patient condition um, once these resuscitative me measures have occurred. So your partner's hooking up the cardiac monitor, uh, you see the rhythm there on the monitor, um, obtaining a blood pressure, SpO2, those types of things, and initiating an IV. So once we kind of have everything together, we notice that this is an extremely st slow rate. This is a symptomatically bradycardic patient and we need to proceed into our directive. So from here, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of things happening all at once. Uh, one person's going to be ventilating, the other person sinks the line in, um, giving a dose of atropine to see if there's any effect on that. And at the same time, you're on the phone getting ready to either get pacing or dopamine orders for this patient. So this concludes about the quickest review of tachycardia, bradycardia directives uh, that we could perform. If you have any other questions regarding these or any other medical directives, please contact one of your regional paramedic educators at the emails listed below.